Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome back to uh, our monthly Duran webinar. Today is uh, about tomorrow, actually, uh, looking ahead to the continuing growth of the smart factory uh, in Industry 4.0. And you're going to be hearing from Joe DeFeo, who started out around Quality 1.0 a few years back and has gone through every era and led every era of the quality movement to this moment. So I know you're going to enjoy it. I'm David Fearon, uh, Duran Fellow and host. If you have questions, you can type them in. I'll keep an eye on them. Joe will too. If it uh, doesn't interrupt the flow too much, uh, he or I will uh, make sure those questions are addressed. Otherwise, we'll be sure that they're uh, reviewed and answered by email at the end. Uh, welcome again. And Joe, here we go. Thank you, Dave, and hello, everyone from around the world. Once again, it uh, seems like these months go by very, very fast. The Smart Factory Industry 4.0 and Quality 4.0. Uh, we're going to try to make some sense of it today and try to help those who are novices understand the impact on them. And those of you who might be already underway in a smart factory, maybe you could pick up a few tidbits along the way. Uh, this is one of our focal points of the year. Uh, there's a lot going on in uh, quality as it relates to the smart factory. So we have a few objectives today. One is just to acquaint you with uh, what this smart factory industry 4.0 and quality 4.0 have on the quality of the products and services as well as on the quality management profession. Uh, our take on this and my opinion on this is it's going to have a very, very big impact uh, and hopefully I can make that point. Uh, we always talk as quality professionals about reducing the cost of poor quality, which are the negative costs. But based on the evidence of these new technologies, we're actually going to see a reduction in the cost of quality, meaning we're going to attain higher levels of quality for less, even beyond the cost of poor quality. And third, uh, those two points, one and two, are going to drastically change the skills of quality professionals. So what are some of those skill changes that we may face? And when I say quality professionals, I'm talking about supplier quality, IT people, operations people, anyone engaged in the management of quality, not just the quality departments who are engaged full time in the management of quality. So what is a smart factory? Or I like to call it the smart workplace. One reason is because a factory is typically a goods place, whereas a workplace could be a non-good. Uh, but to really keep it simple, the factories are leading this charge of interconnectability. And if you don't have a really good definition of a smart factory, uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, which are the same people that manage the National Quality Baldridge Award in the United States, uh, define smart manufacturing as systems that are fully integrated collaborative manufacturing systems that respond in real time to meet changing demands and conditions in the factory, supply network, and customer needs. And I'd like to draw your attention to that. Uh, we always know about conditions in the factory and how they can change based on supplied good and, and various characteristics of temperature and seasons. But we're also looking at the connectivity of the supply network and the customer needs. Theoretically, uh, they are all linked directly to each other. Historically, uh, we have had disconnects which create a lot of poor performance. 
Smart manufacturing is also the ability to solve future problems via an open infrastructure, which means it allows solutions to be implemented, as I used to say, in a nanosecond, which will create uh, much more advantage in value. Uh, the slower it takes to do things, the more products and services wait to be delivered to customer. The longer things wait to be delivered, the greater chance of a demand or a customer changing their mind or doing something different. So one, speed is very critical. But number two, we can't just speed up the process to get products and services faster. We also have to make sure we're capable of delivering them. Uh, Amazon has been a great one at delivering in hours but this past Christmas, and with all the bad weather, they're being challenged by some of the uh, events that slow them down. So we've got to be capable of delivering that value, not just at speed, but both speed and quality. Now, uh, I like this note from uh, GE, General Electric, that they look at a smart factory from three points of view. Uh, intelligent machinery, meaning all the equipment that is in your organization connected to one another, which allows real-time management, real-time change through all this advancement in censoring, controls, and software applications. Advanced analytics, where we're actually using some of the uh, physics-based approach in understanding how things work, how things interrelate to each other, using predictive algorithms based on those ways pe things behave, not just people, uh, and all this technology automation, deep domain expertise, all combined into one, giving us a real advanced analytic view of the world. Uh, we'll talk more about that shortly. And then finally, can't do anything without us. Uh, taking all that intelligent machinery with all those algorithms and making that information available to us at our fingertips wherever we are, whether we're in the factory or at home, to be able to make sure we design, control, and maintain a higher level of quality and safety. Uh, and so regardless of whether you're an operator, a maintenance person, a facilities manager, a quality executive, whatever you are, connecting yourself to the information is what's going to make us more powerful. Now, what is what are these smart factories doing to or for the U.S.? And I say to because if you're in the position of uh, being disrupted, you probably feel like this is impacting you negatively. But what it really is going to do is make things cheaper. Uh, we've already seen some increases in productivity through smart factories, and we will see more of it evidently over the next uh, four or five years uh, to a significant improvement. Smart factories have a potential to add a 500 billion to a trillion and a half dollars in value added to the economy. Uh, and lastly, many manufacturers today either have a smart pack factory initiative going or they're working on one uh, with 14% saying they're satisfied with their level of accomplishment. And here's the opportunity for those of you who might be on this uh, webinar today. Not all organizations know what to do, how to do it. They just know they have to do it. So we're at the early stages in some areas. Uh, and you can't say that 86% are not satisfied with their level. I think what you're hearing is that we've done a pretty good job so far. We have a lot more to do. Now, what is Industry 4.0? If that's a smart factory, what's going on in Industry 4.0? Uh, I believe the German economy and the German manufacturing community coined this Industry 4.0 based on uh, the amount of uh, the amount of tools and technology that can simulate how products and services are delivered, how historically and now new wave robots can do things better, more agile uh, than ever before, the integration of internal systems with external systems, combined with the knowledge of the Internet of Things. It's really putting intelligence behind these things and connecting them together. Uh, if you're not comfortable with the Internet of Things, it really means passing information throughout the internet to control things. Um, the clear, the evidence of maintaining security and secure systems, because the more we become web-based, the more cloud-based, the more easy it is to get into that uh, non-physical space. Uh, the ability to use cloud computing, 
Uh, I was explaining to someone the other day about how a, a college a university students that um, we used to fill rooms with servers and before that with big data drives. Now those are all independent sitting out there in warehouses where all we have to do is tap into that. To us, it looks like a cloud. To them, it's still physical space with physical devices, much smaller than they ever were. Uh, and it's giving us a lot more computing power, even for the small businesses. Uh, if you haven't played any augmented reality video games or watched any TV shows, uh, pretty remarkable what they can do. And uh, they do a tremendous amount from a training point of view to help people simulate and see what actually might be happening. And for many of us uh, quality geeks, uh, utilizing and understanding big data in a way that enables us to determine signal from noise, real news from fake news, good information from bad information. So Industry 4.0 is this current revolution of all this technology coming together in one big happy place, the factory. Now, if you're curious about what came before it, uh, this is about the easiest view that I've seen. We've just basically been entering the fourth generation. And although there's no clear cut period when, uh, the prior generation was the improvement uh, in, I would say, manual labor to automated labor, the use of the computers to manage not only uh, data, but also to manage applications and operations and production and give us the information we want. And I consider that pretty much uh, the last 80 years that you could look at it. Uh, the second industry way was mass production and, and the assembly lines with the advent of electricity. And then prior to that was the mechanization moving off the um, moving off the farms into the early factories and providing us power, steam and energy. Now, if you think about this, this could go back hundreds of years to the first time we've actually seen, you know, power generation. Uh, but really, we think about first, second, third and fourth, and we were to group them into 75 year buckets. It comes out about the closest. So we're just at the beginning of this fourth one. Now, I'm going to come back to the slide a little bit later and explain a little bit about how it, we look at quality 4.0. But I, I need to talk a little bit about quality. Uh, first of all, quality of the product and service are still what customers want and demand. By providing that quality to the customers, we're able to exchange that for money that then pays our bills and makes us profit. Now, in order to make sure that quality happens in the way they, we want it to, we have quality management, the management of that quality. And historically, the management of quality was done by the quality community, the quality departments, the quality assurance personnel, the quality engineers. And whether you were here historically or here currently, you probably still have some little Q focus on quality because it's required. And then there's the big Q focus on quality where we look at performance improvement throughout the organization so that we can provide great customer value, great customer experience. If you're in a hospital, good patient experiences. The things we do, the methods we use, and the way we go about doing it are what we will call our quality management systems. And not just because I'm with Duran Institute, actually 30 years this year, but because Duran's trilogy created a structure that has been embedded in many of the quality management programs that it's built into the ISO standards, it has become known as the normal way to manage for quality. In other words, we plan, control, and improve. And historically, we plan quality by having good agile design thinking programs that enable us to create products and services with innovation in mind and value in mind and profit in mind, if you're a profitable company. Uh, the quality control, quality assurance to make sure whatever is planned is maintained and to continuously improve. Although the ISO standards, particularly 2015, has been in much more inclusive of the trilogy, the registration and audit capabilities are mainly responsible for the quality control, quality assurance. But with the advent of risk management involved, it easily could affect quality improvement, quality assurance, quality planning. 
So although they're getting better, they're not quite where every organization wants to be regarding quality management. Now, if you're not real comfortable with what the Duran Trilogy is in relationship to what you're doing today, think about this. Over time, in my graph, what goes up is bad. And we want to plot how our organization is happening. And if everything worked perfectly, we'd be along the timeline with no defects. Unfortunately, we begin our operations and some things go wrong. We call them waste or cost of poor quality or defects for a finer word. Now, sometimes the performance is out of hand, as you can see by that spike. And we typically know what to do about that spike. And we also aren't bad about maintaining that level of performance. Duran called that quality control. Some of you may go by the words root cause analysis, root cause corrective action, 8Ds, 4Ds, PDSA, PDCA. In other words, we carry out control and root cause corrective action on the sporadic spikes to maintain the performance that was planned prior to launch at the vertical arrow. Now, underneath, that level are things that don't exactly go according to planning or we plan them that way because we just couldn't plan perfection. And if we want to remove that waste, we embark upon improvement, whether it's breakthrough improvement or um, continuous improvement, Kaizen's or rapid improvement, however you want to do it, we typically do it piece by piece, project by project, process by process through the improvement methodologies. Some of you are using Lean and Six Sigma as your improvement methodologies, and that will lead us to, eventually, a better level of performance, which we then are going to control again. So we move from this level of control through improvement back to a level of control, and as we learn things along the way, we can send them back. We send the information lessons learned back to the planning processes so that we can plan new products and services better next time around or plan our business and budgets better next time around. So we plan, control, and improve and keep this cycle going. And it's a good way to think about how to design quality in, how to control it, how to improve it. It's also a way to start to understand how digital quality is going to affect us. Now, some of you might call this whole system your enter-wide, enterprise-wide quality assurance system. Some of you might call it the company-wide system. Some of you might call it the ACME business system. Bottom line, it's all interconnected as part of one system. Now, part of my slide talked about that cost of poor quality. And I mentioned earlier that the uh, real impact on quality as it relates to cost is going to be a result of this industry 4.0. Why? Well, let's think about cost of quality. Cost of quality includes both the good costs that we incur to make sure we don't fail, some costs to check, inspect, review, and test, we call appraisal, and then costs because things go wrong, some of which we catch internally, some of which we catch externally internal failures and external failures. Now, the red represents the negative or the bad cost as a total of the total cost. The yellow are those costs that if they're too excessive, they're bad. But unless we get to perfection, we tend to have some level of checking and testing and auditing. And then prevention clearly are those good costs. So cost of poor quality are a piece of the cost of quality. They are a symptom of a problem within the organization. They're not the problem itself. We can quantify it and make it a driver of performance. And once we quantify it, we tend to include those seven wastes that Taichi Ono uh, narrowed down and talked about because when we have to correct things, over-process things, include conveyance, movement, motion, waiting, overproduction, excess inventory. We have to pay for that. So those seven ways are part of the financial quantification of the problem. Now, a defect causes cost of poor quality, 
and we have to understand where defects come from. And because we may have had too many defects, we also build in extra quality assurance, extra quality audit. And because lately we get so worried about meeting regulatory requirements, we also tend to have excess audit, which could mean excess appraisal. So there is some positive impact of this smart factory on the cost of quality and negative impact on the people who do quality. Let's think about cost of poor quality as the entire left side, purple and green. We spend money and we make a profit. Part of spending money includes tasks that help us achieve the quality we need. If we were to examine that cost of quality, as I said in the previous slide, it would be broken up into failures, appraisals, and prevention. Now, historically, the red area was the target of root cause corrective action, lean, quality improvement, Six Sigma, so that we could reduce those failures. And when I say Six Sigma, I'm also referring to design for Six Sigma or better innovation and design thinking. Because some of the failures we have were designed that way and therefore have to be designed out. Some of the failures occur just because of variation in supplied quality, supplier parts, et cetera. A lot of quality improvement activities, as I showed in the trilogy, aim themselves at internal failures and external failures. We increase costs to prevent failure, and then we drive down those failures. And in my 30 years, most organizations, 75 to 80 percent of their cost of poor quality, which then becomes their cost of quality, have been in these failure costs. Now, as organizations and technology get a better understanding of how to manage variation, we have driven down the failure costs quite a bit. Uh, some organizations tenfold or fiftyfold. Whereas when I started my career, we would quantify the cost of poor quality as the total cost of sales as somewhere between 30 to 40 percent, meaning that was a lot of waste in the system. In the last decade or so, we're seeing that number to be more like 15 or 20 percent. That means if you lumped all the costs of these failures appraisal into one across the entire enterprise, they're still significant. But we have reduced the failures significantly. Just take a look at products you buy and how few defects you have as a result. Now, if an organization historically wanted to improve profit but could not expand their marketplace, they attacked the total cost of operation. Now, we could attack that by reducing or making ourselves more efficient, doing more with less, and a lot of our lean tools help us do that. We could also attack the cost of quality. And I don't mean the good one, the bad one. Go after the failures. But what happens when the failures are down and the operations are lean? What do we do next? And herein lies the opportunity for digital quality 4.0. My belief is that we are going to spend more money on prevention and we are going to drastically cut failures further and drastically cut appraisal time, appraisal tasks, which will help us be profitable. Now, I wanted to use this scenario if we can't expand our business, organizations are, can, are going to continue to look to make a profit from reducing either the cost of poor quality the cost of unnecessary good quality, like too much appraisal, too much audit, too much test, and improve the efficiency of operations. A lot of the cost of operations improvement in the industry 4.0 are going to come from simpler, easier ways to communicate information throughout the supply chain, which reduces our time to move things it improves supply networks, it improves supplier quality, it improves things throughout the system, thereby allowing us, the producer, 
to spend less money and less time on the opposite of those things. So if we were to look back then and say, let's put the trilogy and quality management in perspective. Self-inspection and maybe a little bit of third-party inspection is probably what the first generation looked like. We sorted good things and bad things. If they broke, we fixed them. With mass production, and if you study anything about Duran and Deming, uh, as mass-produced products come down the assembly line, we began to separate the suppliers from the producers, the producers from the customers, and we replaced it with more inspection, some quality control, quality assurance, and then later, or I should say earlier into the uh, 20th century, uh, things like military standards 9858, which were truly quality control standards. And as we moved more towards the third generation, we continued to improve by adding quality improvement, quality planning to our cadre of trilogy methods like quality control and began to start seeing some of the technology being applied to being able to do root cause analysis faster, being able to uh, do procedures better, being able to report corrective action better in, I would call it the first generation of software. And here we are uh, now in an interconnected digital world which will create a digital quality management world. I just wanna pause Dave and see if there are any questions that we might have right now uh, that before I go into uh, a next phase of this important discussion. No, Joe, I think you have us hanging on the edges of our chairs. At this point, there are no questions, but folks, you're more than uh, invited to come in and start posing them. Uh, but keep going, Joe, because I think you're, uh, you're getting us uh, some very okay. valuable so, information. I know one thing, most of the people that join this webinar are process knowledge folks. If you're not, real simply, a process, a series of steps to carry out a goal. So if we're making a, a, a widget, we got material coming in, we process that widget on equipment and we pass that widget off. Uh, if, we're, if we're moving paperwork, we do the same thing. We use process. Uh, whether you're big equipment, little equipment, we use process. So the only purpose of these two pictures is to show you that we use a process. However, if we dig deeper into that process, what does it look like? Well, first of all, in green means these are the required steps to carry out our process to be able to deliver an output. Whether it's a chemical, whether it's a mortgage, whether it's surgery, whether it's a cell phone, the output is delivered to the customer the best of our ability on time and we make a profit. If everything goes in green, that's what's required. But we know that not everything goes green because maybe our inputs are wrong, maybe the variables change, maybe the weather changes. So we build into the steps work instructions for people doing the job to know how to do the job and in case something doesn't work. We go one step further and we identify in the process where variables are critical to quality, critical to production, critical to excellence, so that we can focus on those to make sure if we meet these requirements, the outputs are good. Not only that, for every critical to quality parameter, we actually have decisions we make on a frequency which could be minutes, hours, weeks, months, so that we make sure that if we measure what's critical, we have to decide are we within our control limits or not. We can go one step further at what that means. What that means is for every critical to quality characteristic in production, in operations, in any function, we establish some baseline target that that we're operating at some baseline of performance and that baseline of performance can be monitored in actual time and we compare our baseline of right now to our target if there's a difference we take action if there's no difference we keep the process moving as we carry out these control loops throughout all our processes and all of them are in control we can produce a very 
effective, and efficient outcome, product, service, or good for our customer or for our next person in line. If we establish baseline performance and we compare it to the target and it's out of control or not doing what it's supposed to, taking action could mean simply adjusting a piece of equipment, simply doing some root cause analysis, or it could take quite a bit of analysis to find corrective action. And historically, those steps take a long time. And because we don't want to have too many failures with the cost, uh, too many failures with the uh, control loops, we periodically audit. We periodically audit to make sure the work instructions are right. We audit to make sure the critical to quality baselines are right. We audit to make sure people are following the right procedures. We audit. If we have too many defects in a period of time, we audit more. If we have better confidence, we audit less. So quality in the eyes of the trilogy and quality management, we build in to our day-to-day -day processes by making sure that we have the right emphasis on the right characteristics to support the production or operational processes. If we don't do that, we run the risk of delivering poor quality to our customers because life is full of variation. Now, how will this new technology change our role and how does it impact this picture of what I just said? Well, let's take a simple work instruction. Work instructions are always a nightmare for organizations because anytime something changes, you have to adjust them. Work instructions also can be very complex. So when you have to change them, they take a long time. Work instructions become useless pieces of paper once an employee thinks they know what they're doing and avoids looking at them. So the more visual we get, the less paper we get, the more PDAs, uh, 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 PCs, laptops, cell phones, screens you see, the greater chance of keeping things up to date and also providing visual work instructions in real time. Uh, the training is changing. We can use augmented reality and simulation to teach people right on the job how to do their job or put them in a classroom and simulate by looking at their actual factory what is going on because we have real-time sensors showing this. I believe the audit and quality is going to get better but less frequent because we don't need to do as many of them if we have less defect. And also the, the labor that goes into audits is like the labor that goes into the Monday morning meeting and the quarterly business reports, often extensive and unmonitored, therefore unmeasured, therefore unimproved. Uh, machine monitoring and maintenance. Uh, many organizations want to run equipment until it breaks, then we fix it and we live with the pain. Other organizations are doing more reliable uh, reliability maintenance and maintaining not only the performance, but monitoring it before it shuts down and breaks. Well, we'll just be able to do better of that, more of that, because sensors will be monitoring more critical characteristics of the machinery itself. Uh, man monitoring, uh, monitoring products in production, monitoring products in the supply chain will become easier and easier. Uh, I have a tile, a device attached to my keys uh, that tells me where my keys are when I forget them. Well, I forgot them in North Carolina last week, uh, and I was able to go online and find them. Uh, just think what we could do if we attach that to everything in our system so that we can locate and follow things. A customer can theoretically watch their car being built day by day in the factory. Now, that's a nice thing, but what does it do to us as business folks? If we can see it, we can fix it. If we see it and it's not where it's supposed to be, we can fix it. Uh, also provides feedback to our customer, to our suppliers uh, on, and our customers internally to make sure they know where we are all at. And last, uh, the last piece is that there's actually some pretty cool uh, lean improvement, continuous improvement apps which provide real-time data so we could do much better corrective action, much more improvement faster. Now, so what does what does those new technologies do? Do you notice everything is green? I called green the operational steps. 
in red the quality steps because they tended to be done as a third party. Well, the, these new technologies are going to make this in such a real time that we don't need to have so many people doing manual tasks and so many people waiting for information because the information is there. So we're able to carry out in real time, or at least in closer to real time, these feedback loops. So now what happened to all the bodies that were hanging out with all these manual processes? Well, they're doing preventive work. They're doing audit of the entire system on a better basis. They are working with operations to make sure that the next generation of product coming down is ready to go online. They're not spending time dealing with bad suppliers. They're not spending time dealing with so many defects. They're doing preventive work. Unfortunately, some of us that manage defects may have less work to do. Some of us that are inspectors may not ever have that job again. That is the technology improvement that drives our labor out. But I like to think of it this way, is that as we have been reducing labor in some areas, we are definitely increasing it in others, and that's the case here. So why is Industry 4.0 good for business, and how is that going to be good for us? Well, first of all, uh, there is not a project in a company that I've seen that when they're looking for data, they can't find it, they can't get it, and if they find it and get it, it takes so long to do it, and many times uh, it is not what they want. So data availability, and keep in mind that data itself is not information, but information is derived from data, which comes from information that comes off of equipment and sensors. So the more data we have, the greater chance we can find information. No more data keepers. Uh, one of my colleagues, Pete Robustelli, uh, wanted to make sure that we talk about this because do you ever have the need to get information from your organization and the people who own the data don't have time? Or if they do have time, you're not a priority. And if they do have time, they like to keep you in suspense. So too many people have access to the data you need, but they don't really understand when you need it and how you need it. This quality 4.0 should minimize data keepers. The data keepers are gonna be the cloud, not the bodies. No more Monday morning meetings. Uh, Monday morning meetings is a, is a phenomena in many organizations where we meet to discuss the level of defects, the level of failures, the level of production, the level of safety that we had yesterday or last week. Well, if we can get closer to perfection, those meetings don't have to be focused on the latest sporadic spike. They could spend time talking about how do we get better and better and better, not how do we correct what's worse, worse, and worse. Less audit requests and inquiries. My Lord, so many organizations complain they have so many audits to do. And uh, audits tend to come from many different places, ask similar questions about different things. Uh, and so although you only provide one audit a year, the person you're auditing may get audited by 10. So one thing about this technology, it should provide us better scorecards, better real-time data, less need for so many audits, more need to act on the information we get. And lastly, smart factories need smart workers. There is no question that the lesser skilled role of inspectors and testers will be removed and eliminated and be replaced with people who understand large data analytical capabilities to analyze big data, how to use these technologies and how to think a little bit more out of the box with their colleagues so they'll be able to collaborate. Now, I'm not sure how skilled you are to handle quality 4.0, but our clients are speeding up very quickly. And if you're in one of those organizations that is really moving fast on smart factories, you do not feel very smart sometimes. As a matter of fact, some of you might feel that you're just getting up to quality 3.0. So here's a way to think about the skill disruption and what you need to think about in terms of closing the gap. 
if quality control and root cause corrective action are going to be carried out by the people doing the work, there's going to be less need for third party staff doing that. That means if you spend time doing a lot of monitoring of corrective action procedures, corrective action tasks, you're probably not going to have a lot to do. However, that skill you have about coaching and facilitating might come in handy. Uh, QA is going to be more responsible for monitoring scorecards of bigger processes, supply chains, networks, uh, and be able to take action to either redesign or maintain those systems. Uh, the traditional QA is could be a broader QA. I, you've heard integrated quality systems, unified quality systems. Uh, we we espouse enterprise systems where whether it's a financial audit, a supplier audit, a safety audit, a quality audit might all come together into one general audit. So QA is going to change. Now quality improvement is very interesting. Quality improvement are is that ad hoc continuous improvement initiative that goes throughout the entire organization. Uh, I believe this will continue. Uh, and we may have a need for less long, big projects because one of the big difficulties is knowledge of how the process is working and how to get data. Well, if we can do those faster through technology, then our application of Lean and Six Sigma will only be that much better. And then on the quality planning side, I believe this is where a lot of the emphasis for uh, most of the quality professional is happening today anyway. As we've gotten better at operational quality, we tend to move upstream. Uh, one step is upstream to suppliers, another step is upstream to design. And so quality by design, design for Six Sigma, design thinking uh, will be very important in your skill set to maintain your role as a quality professional. Now, historically, we conduct a skills assessment and we look at the skills for quality professionals in seven different categories. Um, because a quality professional tended to be someone who worked outside of operational activity, they had to be well versed in coaching and teamwork. Because they deal with data, they have to understand data analysis and stats. Because they solve problems, uh, we need to understand root cause analysis. Because we have to plan, control, improve throughout an organization, we have to understand our methods and our theory of quality. To be able to control process, we have to understand process control. To be able to think about process, about quality, to be able to convince management and leadership to act, we have to have critical thinking abilities. And to make sure we, everything stays in great shape, we need to be able to assess and audit. Now, what you see in front of you is a very typical uh, response over many years of people taking our skills assessment. And if you'd notice that the two areas that are the strongest, I should say the one area that is the strongest and the one area that is the weakest are two areas that we're going to need opposite of going forward. In other words, many of the participants, which are quality professionals, are very capable of auditing and assessing. But by the stats picture, green is better, they're not as capable. So if you felt that your skills were lacking in industry 3.0, it's only going to get tougher in 4.0. You need to shift your time from assessment and auditing to get better at statistics. We also need to move that teamwork and coaching because we're going to be required to be more collaborative. We're going to need to shift that to more green. Process control is going to be a less of an importance. It happened to be the second thing we're most comfortable with, but because the process control is going to be done by automation, we may not be involved at all. So in other words, we need to become better coaches, better collaborative, better use of analyzing big data, uh, better critical thinkers, and less auditors, and less worried about process control. And so if you're not one of those people thinking that way, you need to start thinking that way. I also believe that um, organizations like the American Society for Quality, uh, Society for Manufacturing Engineers, they will play catch up and change the body of knowledge required 
and the certifications required. We've already begun to do that over a year ago with regard to quality improvement uh, tasks and activities. So what are some of these new skills? Collaboration. You got to work across functions more than ever. And I used to say that we were the police people of an operation. Now we have to become uh, not the chief of police, not the police, but a equal collaborator with operations. We need to be seen as a partner in operations now. We need to get much better at data analytics to separate the real stuff from the fake stuff. We have to work digitally. You know, everything can be digital if you want it to be, even audits, even documentation for how to do their job. So we have to learn how to work digitally from where we are. Uh, we have to be much faster, less frequent audits, and done via the web. I met someone recently. They had There are four people, 10,000 suppliers. They had a requirement in the company to visit every supplier every two years. Mathematically, that's not going to happen, and it's never happened. But we have a much better chance of making it happen if we can connect with them and do less frequent audits more on a uh, web-based basis. And with those suppliers, uh, we need to do we need to spend a lot more time on developing suppliers. Uh, so instead of supplier audit, we have to become supplier consultants. We have to understand what's critical to quality in our products that we give to suppliers to produce and how well they're maintaining them. Because the more variation on the input, the more difficult our smart factory is going to be throughout. So uh, this I had more fun preparing for this one because I love this topic, I love this subject, and I'm trying to put it in a way that says, wow, get acquainted with Smart Factories Industry 4.0 and believe there's a quality 4.0. If you're one of those organizations that are out there making quality management software like Viva, Intellex, uh, Minitab, Tulip, there are so much technology moving forward out there. You need to understand the quality profession, and the quality profession needs to understand the technology. And I believe that's going to come together faster and faster in this quality 4.0. Uh, hope you understand the impact on cost of quality, not just cost of poor quality. And I hope you understand that our skills are going to shift and shift even faster to meet these new challenges of these smart factories. Uh, I hope that um, I have put some of these objectives into honest discussion and I look forward to which I always get questions and feedback whether they're in this session now or whether they come to us later uh, as you know you can get a copy of this presentation uh, it will be sent to those of you who are participating online uh, just by your showing up here uh, so Dave I'd like to flip it back to you and uh, make sure that we have met all the requirements of our participants here I've been watching the questions uh, unfold, Joe, as you've talked, and I think it's interesting that uh, just about the time someone would pose a question, like how soon are we going to see smart factories coming on in our experience, you, you addressed it. And some others talked about uh, how we could deal with all this data and complexity, and you talked about that. Uh, I think uh, it is uh, better at this point for people to get that link and replay this and think it through, pause it from moment to moment as you, as Joe uh, creates more knowledge for us about the future because as is almost a cliche, the future in this regard is now. And the faster we can move our brains and the feet to go along with it, I think the more we're going to enjoy uh, the more preventative and more developmental role of quality and quality professions uh, than just being that cop that Joe talked about. Uh, this has been a good one, and we've got another uh, exciting topic coming up at the end of April. Uh, we will review the questions, uh, uh, and Joe might be able to send out a couple of emails uh, along those lines. Uh, I think what I, I will pick off one more, Joe, just, just to give you one more word on this. Uh, Yusuf asked, how can we start implementing Quality 4.0? Quick thought on that. Well, it's a very interesting question. Um, so 
because you can't just do it alone, my suggestion is that you have to pair up with operations, whether that be your production people, if you're in a small factory or higher level folks, and and you have to come up with a strategy that says, we want to move forward. Um, that's the big picture. We want to come up with a strategy. As an individual, my belief is that you get right down to that deeper understanding is how can we eliminate our audits, too much test, too much inspection, and not acting fast enough on our feedback loops. The solution to those are gonna require you to look at technology or system software, which is gonna force you to look at technology for sensors that may be required for your devices, which is going to force you to ask the question, do we have the most efficient process? So in other words, I believe the quality professional could take charge by saying, these paperwork processes, these slow tasks we do, have to go away. And they might even challenge my role, but somebody has to do it. And I wanna contrast that to if you don't do it, someone else will. Here's what I'm finding. Operations people are leading the charge, mm -hmm. not quality people, not even the financial people. This is truly a manufacturing thing driven by manufacturing people with the excitement that I haven't seen since the quality revolution. So on a big picture, you need to get a group of people together and come up with a plan and a strategy for quality 4.0. Secondly, on an individual basis, do what you can to highlight the inefficiencies that we have. I would like to see us be much more efficient at quality management and much more effective. I hope that helps. Joe, one, one more tagline here, uh, a, a really good question. Can uh, Duran help uh, in this process of learning how to catch up with quality 4.0? Are there some uh, systems that you have uh, on tap now or soon uh, where people can start learning from Duran? Uh, well, you know, obviously we're trying to keep up too. So we've got a couple of interesting things going on. But from a learning point of view, uh, we're, we're launching our Impro platform, which is a technological platform to allow you to um, search all the topics uh, right at your fingertips, like kind of like a Wikipedia for quality and operations. Um, that's called our, data, our, called our um, knowledge base. We also have our training and all our workshops in there so you can become certified quickly. So from a technology point of view of delivering information, we're moving forward on that. But we're also working with uh, various partners, quality management system companies, as well as manufacturing app companies, to try to make it easier for quality professionals to understand how to utilize these. And there are various organizations out there that are leading the pack uh, on these new manufacturing apps. Uh, so we've partnered with them to try to bring two operations in quality how to convert your manual or semi-manual quality control process to a more up-to-date process. So uh, that's what we're doing. And, and uh, the good thing is I think we're all beginning and early and new. And I'm going to make one last comment. People say, what's new in quality management? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's like saying what's new in financial management. It's not about what's new. It's about what is the newest way to apply them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if we think about Excel spreadsheets and how they revolutionized finance and how QuickBooks like systems have revolutionized finance, we're still doing finance credits and debits. We're still doing that, but it's the way we do it. So this is a real big change in quality management because it's going to be able to do things better than we've ever done them before. And it is new because it is going to create a new cadre of quality professionals uh, than ever before. And I'll leave it at that. Well, I thank you all for staying a few minutes over our usual 45. I think you gained a lot in those last few minutes. And we will definitely look forward to addressing other questions that we see after we close. This is it for now. I'm David Firon. I'm very proud to be a fellow of the Duran Institute uh, and to know Dr. Joe DeFeo as someone who is still out there kicking it. <laughs> 30 years in, and congratulations, Joe, on 30 years. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.